defining uh, crypto economics was more strictly around mining. When we think about crypto economics, we think strictly more around at a mining layer. But if you broaden that concept, generalize concept a little bit, it's actually a more um, encapsulating kind of concept, which includes mining, which basically secure the network such that the consensus cannot be easily attacked and broken. Uh, but also it can be broadly include things like incentivizing developers, uh, like who actually gets the tokens. If I have 100 million Blizzard's tokens, uh, the developer may get 10 million in mass, such that to reward their work. It's also about gamification. Uh, when you, you have different list, uh, level of actors, you have developers, you have users, uh, you have purchasers, investors, etc. So all of these actors require some economic incentives to perform what they are supposed to do. Um, and uh, tokens are usually a pretty good way of incentivizing different actors. You can have developers to you know, compensate for some work they've done. You can also use that as a way, for example, to encourage people to um, open their ads, such that you can monetize the DAP. Um, and by do by opening the ads, you can give them certain crypto tokens. Why would you use a crypto token instead of um, a Bitcoin? A one simple uh, argument is it's a price discovery mechanism. <coughs> If I have to use Bitcoins, which is a very established value, to reward my actors, which means I really, as a developer, someone, a creator, I have to purchase a large amount of Bitcoins and reward them, that's a cost. But instead of that, before the price and value, let's let the market discover its own price. We'll create a token, which is just initially funny internet money that you know, no one cares, zero value. But you started with there, and you actually distribute these tokens, and after a while, the market will set its own price. But from you know a genesis, Creation perspective, it's free money to start with. So yeah, bootstrapping and contingent price discovery. Um, so in general, I, I kind of consider this broad thing really as a design pattern uh, rather than a you know, space of science, but it's something important components that previously were just very hard to do, um, especially when you, well, you have things like airline miles that being there forever, but uh, airline miles, since it's not liquid, it's not um, a shared state, it's really hard to have these Marketing discovery mechanisms, incentives, etc., and a fair design. It's more a centralized control. So that's you basically have a new, completely new design pattern uh, for you to use. Um, the other way to think about why do we need crypto tokens is think about software. So open source software. So for the last 20 years, uh, one important paradigm shift is we're moving into an increasing adoption of open source software. Uh, Richard M. Stallman, I think, started kind of that kick off that movement in the late 80s and 90s. It doesn't get a lot of traction until I think in t starting 2000, we're seeing much more Linux uh, adoption. And I think one of the bigger challenges with there is really the incentives. Like, who, everybody wants open source software, but who's going to compensate them? And that's a major, major challenge. And uh, before the, that, you really don't have a good mechanism until we see in crypto projects that actually create their own tokens. Uh, you can criticize them, but uh, at the very end, I see a much better outcome. I see these crypto tokens rewarded, you know, let's say, uh, $18 million Ethereum, that it would otherwise take forever to fundraise $18 million, right? $18 million is like a Series B, which could take three or five years, or maybe you will never get it for such an ambitious project. But now you have an accelerated timeline that actually give you a way to compensate and monetize, uh, so you have incentive and the funding, you know, to do uh, what they're trying to do. So I think it's a really powerful uh, paradigm. Um, and if you contrast that to the traditional corporate world, traditional model was in pre-crypto model. You have a couple of classic models. One is product sales. So you have something like Apple. You know, you just make great products and uh, people will buy them. So that's a simple, most easy way to, to monetize it, or it could be software. Um, this, the other model is, is extra service. Extra service is things like you know, uh, Red Hat. But unfortunately, in, uh, in so many open source projects, there's only one Red Hat. We have never seen the second public company that actually relies primarily on open source. That's just amazing, right? To look at how many open source projects have been there, and you have not seen quite a few successful projects, um, companies that relies on open source model primarily. The third model, what's that? I think they are, and they're just not very large. There's lots of little companies that rely on public, open source. Public companies that went public. So the Red Hat is the only one that I'm aware of and going on a public, on NASDAQ level. Right. Um, so third one, asymmetric monetization, which is another name for ads. So, but really, but you think about the nature of that is really, it's asymmetric. Because it's, when you browsing Gmail, 
um, you have an email that talks about washing machine, what wash, washing machine you buy. You see little ads that Samsung comes up. So it's Samsung subsidizing uh, Google to pay for your Gmail operation cost. And the great thing about that is just like insurance, it's asymmetric and it's also um, a pool that basically you may not buy these Samsung washing machine, but someone else reading the ads will. And therefore you got subsidized. So that's why we have these wonderful internet softwares. So that's almost like the backbone of the internet. But these three are the three classic models of how do you monetize something of value. Now with crypto, I think a lot is something really interesting. Um, the first model, and they're all connected to crypto tokens. The first way <coughs> is you, you have signerage. Signerage, signerage is a concept of um, the difference between the marginal cost of producing money and the marginal, you know, uh, the value. So you basically, uh, you know, printing digital tokens, the marginal cost is zero. You know, you got 100 million instantly created Doge coins. Now, if Doge coins started getting, you know, adoption, the original holders and the original minters obviously um, gets value. That's like signing um, Second, capital gain. Uh, it's very similar. Uh, by holding onto these tokens on early, uh, you have an appreciation. So you see a future, a brighter future that other people don't see yet. Right, so it's a uh, it's another proof of uh, market inefficiency, right? Because you, if everybody appreciates value, it will never increase. It will cost an equilibrium. But you know, gladly, some people will see it earlier, more value. So you're holding more of your own crypto tokens. Uh, the last one is rewards, um, kind of related. You could use rewards to award people <coughs> for incentivizing certain behavior, uh, to be honest, or providing certain services. Uh, but the, the fundamental contrast between two class buckets of model is in the first model, it's always about some kind of centralization. It's about some people, the minority people, um, controlling uh, the data, controlling, like for example, Google in that case, guarding your identity data, they hold your history, uh, etc., and they monetize it. The second class, the difference is everything is still open, but you rely on a success, you ride on a success. It, it's like almost investing, um, instead of you know a private product, you're investing in the GDP of that network, if that makes sense. So I think that's a two fundamental difference. I hope that answers the question around that monetization question. Just on that, I mean, I, I know you talked quite a bit about token. Can you just drill down a bit more into it? Like, uh, say that again. Can you just drill down a bit more into a token? A token. With an example. Uh, yes, uh, I think we'll have a plenty of examples on a different crypto project that actually attempts to use tokens. So we'll see that. Um, all right, so we'll just jump right into it. So let's talk about a few examples of some interesting distributed applications. Some of them I wouldn't use the term application because they're more infrastructure layer. Uh, some of them are more application. This is an example of an infrastructure. So Bitcoin blockchain is a great $500 million or $200 million time stamping machine every year that people are pouring into electricity costs to create a firewall uh, to prevent against attack. Uh, the problem with that is every transaction is expensive, it's not massively scalable. So some guys in Austin created this wonderful project called Factum, and the idea is basically they create a massively scalable data layer uh, for the blockchain. Um, they, their basic architecture is they have federated nodes, uh, which means a group of private or semi-private servers uh, that together process a hash all the data, and they create a Merkle, uh, Merkle tree, and then they can put that Merkle tree root hash onto the Bitcoin blockchain. Uh, so you have a two-layer structure. The traditional structure, and some, a lot of you, I think, have tried op return, right? So op return is basically writing your hash directly onto the Bitcoin blockchain. But imagine if your data is a million times more, how do you scale that? You would put it into a two-layer structure. Uh, you would put uh, the hash of your a million records, uh, each of them onto the factum chain. And the factum chain would construct a more root hash, and that would put that hash onto the Bitcoin blockchain, right? So it's a two-layer structure. Um, what you get in advantage, uh, you know, as advantage is you got a one minute confirmation time, back time tune a lot faster, uh, but ultimately it's still guarded by the 10 minute confirmation time on the Bitcoin blockchain. You got also most of the security properties of the Bitcoin blockchain as the ultimate consensus. Now let's talk about the token part. So the Factum guys are really interesting, uh, they create a really interesting solution. Uh, traditionally, when you have a crypto token, um, how many of you are familiar with MasterCoin or um, Counterparty? Cool. Um, so they did a well, so counterparty did not do a crowd sale, but they did a proof of burn, which is kind of similar to what um, uh, is, except they don't get the money and they benefit the whole Bitcoin network. Uh, Mastercoin did crowd sale. Now what they basically does is they create a token, and that token is a must in order to use the Mastercoin or counterparty network. So for example, in counterparty, if you want to create a new asset called gold coin, you have to pay I think 0.5 XCP 
to create uh, an asset. Where would you get the 5.5 XDP? You either buy it from a secondary market, like a Peter or a Poloniex and the exchange markets, which drives the demand because there's limited amount of XDP, right? Um, or you would uh, buy it initially as a proof of burn, right? That's your initial sales process. So that kind of creates a pegging for that value of the tokens. The problem with that structure, it's been mostly wonderful, but um, the problem with that structure is the value fluctuates. So assuming you're not a speculator, right? From a speculator perspective, it's actually pretty great, right? XCP has appreciated, I think, by uh, the highest 12 times in the last uh, one year launch, <coughs> and that's pretty awesome. But if you're an actual bank, imagine you're a bank or you're a, a, a user that don't really want to hold these really volatile tokens, right? Um, how do you do that? Factum solved that problem by creating two classes of tokens. One is called Factoid. It just, uh, it's as speculative or fluctuating as other tokens would possibly be. But there's not something else called entry credits. Entry <coughs> credits corresponds one-to-one -one into, um, so every time when you create a new entry into Factum chain, it costs you exactly one entry, entry credits, um, no more, no less. Um, but there's a Factoid that is in between. Uh, factoid basically as a liquid instrument that can the network, every time you as a factum miner, you will get be rewarded for one for X amount of factoid by doing certain work for the network. Uh, you're rewarded for that. And every time when you wanted to create an entry, you have to spend entry credits. But you have but in order to create entry credits, you have to burn your factoid or spend your factoid and convert it into an entry credits. And therefore basically you have one stable instrument, you have one uh, valuation instrument that incentivizes the network to do more work. So that's kind of how they solve it uh, in terms of fluctuation. Does that probably answer some of your questions around monetization? I hope. So, uh, so on factum, how you get a consensus and then another user to say that. Say again? Uh, so they're, they're, uh, they're saying one minute confirmation time, right? So yeah. what, what kind of consensus are they from other? I think the consensus part is something they're just trying to figure out. I, I, what I heard latestly is uh, something around delegated proof of work, I think, or stake. Um, I'm not exactly sure. But um, yeah. But so the difference, I think, in fact. a little centralized in the sense that. It could be. And initially, I think the plan is probably they will run half of the nodes. But the difference, in fact, in chain is uh, you have. Um, they would pre-approve and vet um, some kind of identity probably involved in a more closely gated. So the assumption around you know simple uh, uh, you know the Byzantine general problem is more relaxed in that context. <coughs> yeah. Factoid. So you burn factoid. You burn it or do you sell it to get it? You burn. You burn. So the factoid. Volume exactly. That's actually the other interesting mechanism. So we had a couple of interesting discussions. I, I think the, there are a couple of variations of design. Initially, I think it was more around transmitting factoids, but then we, we actually, I think, conclusion that I think burning, just like Ethereum does, I think it makes more sense. It creates more scarcity in terms of economic value. So uh, there are different reasons for why you want to burn uh, factoids. So these guys are a central trusted party. Like I want to put something on this blockchain and I have to trust them for at least 10 minutes, right? Uh, yes, for the 10 minute time, I think so. Uh, except I, they do have an interesting design where they have two type of nodes. One is a processor, a miner. The other is a validator. So a validator always, you know, valid check against the other processors. So there's some level of trust involved, but um, I wouldn't say it's it's that bad. But the centralized data, way. But the data is all stored with them, right? So it's sometimes in it is really the multiple trees that are stored. They can by th by them really means a network of miners. But initially, uh, it's factor not. Market. Um, yes, factor miners. Yes, yeah. but as over time, you would hopefully that uh, pool will diversify itself. Um, initially, they might bootstrap the network by let's say there's ten nodes and they run six of the nodes. But over time, it may be a thousand nodes and they run two or three. So, yeah. So, I'm a user. I Depends on what kind of user you are. If you, you want to use the yeah. service, if you're the service, you would buy the entry credits, entry credits. and the guy who sell the entry credits are going to be the miners because they're rewarded with with um, with uh, fact toys, right? So they have the ability to burn, and they can sell you the entry credits. Okay. <coughs> the other question is, uh, if you use a two-layer blockchain, <coughs> is then I'm guessing I'm suspecting are they going to bundle a lot of transactions? Yeah, bundle as in you have a single finger fingerprint that kind of a proof and validates the rest of the uh, so entries. So like 
hundreds or thousands of transactions going to back to Right. Uh, what's going into the real blockchain is going to be one single. Yeah. Exactly. So how do a user going to check uh, okay this transaction? If I want to do my own personal check and I don't want to rely on some of the service to them, how would that work? Yeah, you would, I guess, check the you know final um, um, hash against uh, the factum entries, um, and then based on the factum entries, you would know whether that document existed, right? So you obviously have to check. So they're going to give you some 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 yeah. information so they get checked. Right, right. And what about the training? Um, all right, so that's factum. Uh, sorry. Uh, you mentioned the uh, lessons. Yeah. Are they? I believe they had like a pre-sale last week where they're giving out tokens just to see how the traction is in the market yeah. right now. I haven't been following too much on that Lazoo thing, but I think it's really something interesting stuff. Though my personal opinion is I, I do think there is a value at, at this point for a centralized service like Uber. Uh, I think in general I see more value in commoditized industry that moving more into decentralization. Um, because commoditized things are things that you don't require a lot of education, a lot of concentrated marketing efforts, and et cetera, et cetera. Therefore, decentralization, it all comes down to efficiency and cost. And that's exactly where decentralization kind of uh, excels at. Uh, but when you talk about something like Uber, it's a relatively new movement. A lot of governments are still don't like it, consider it illegal. You need a lot of lobbyists, you need marketing efforts. These are tend to be done better with a centralized company, instead of an uncoordinated swarm of you know efforts. So. Um, so that's why I'm less optimistic about Lazoo's at this point, but it's an interesting testing. We'll see. Deckbound. <coughs> um, so I'm going to share a video. So Deckbound is a, a really interesting project. They, they are the first blockchain um, tr card trading game. So actually initially Quantify was started with the goal of to blockchainify a lot of the multiplayer games. And then we realized blockchain at the time, a year ago, wasn't really a very good uh, instruments of, and there doesn't seem to even a strong advantage of having a decentralized game. But interesting enough, there's apparently this really interesting niche called card trading game. Um, you know, the most one of the most famous one being Magic the Gathering, uh, not a, not the Mountain Gox, but that's uh, the actual card trading game. So they use basically a color coin like scheme to track all the cards. And when you think of card trading game, it's a classic example of something that you has economic value and it's a traded and uh, moving around between different players. So let me just play this video. So. Contribution to the deckbound Genesis system. 
Any interested party can purchase part of a Genesis block, and every time a card is sold from that block, they're paid 25% of the sale price. We've intentionally built the Bitbind.io service and the Deckbound API as open systems that can be used by players, programmers, and anybody else, whether it be to extend the Deckbound games, build different games, or architect entirely different applications. The Bitbind.io service is designed to sit alongside the Bitcoin blockchain and provide extensibility for a number of application spaces. For more information about everything discussed in this video, check out deckbound.com or bitbind.io for more information about the Bitbind service. Pretty cool, isn't it? Um, this is the first card trading game. Um, after them, I think there's also another one called Spell of Genesis, which is very similar. And both of them are a card trading game. I think it's not a coincidence that somehow people realize that Bitcoin is a perfect um, vehicle for recording something of value, and that is scarce. Um, so, so that's deck bound, and they basically, you know, build two layers. They first build a deck um, deck bound. It's uh, the bid bind itself, which is basically a color coin, but some degree centralized, such that he can get revenue. I think that's the main purpose and why he does not use color coin. Uh, the second part is the game itself, which basically you have a Genesis block, and people could buy into that Genesis block of the tokens, and with that, uh, uh, people would get sheer value increases um, as they issue more um, cars and decks uh, over time. Uh, so this is a really interesting use. It doesn't really use, I think, anything particularly fat, um, um, fancy about the blockchain other than the notarization. It's really just tokenization and tracking these cars, where do they go to, uh, etc. But I think it's a very interesting, extremely interesting use case. All right. Um, last one. Um, really cool example, P2P prediction markets. How many of you are familiar with prediction markets? All right. Okay, cool. Um, one third. So I think the best pitch I've heard so far uh, last week is Google for the future. The last, uh, so I think Jack from Augur was doing a presentation and he showed two slides. The first slide is a Google and type in who is the president of the United States and you got the answer instantly from Google. The second slide would show who will be the f uh, president of the United States in 2016 and Augur tells you, you know, here's the probabilities of three different candidates. I think that's the best way of understanding prediction markets. Um, the other classic example quoted is the candy <coughs> jar. So I think in 2007, there's a Columbia Business School professor uh, did this uh, fun experiment of trying to ask students to guess how many candies are in the jar. Um, and I think the answers ranges from anywhere from 250 to 4,000. There's a gigantic variation there. And on average, the standard error is 700. So most people are very, very wrong, right, basically. But apparently, the average of all these answers come down to 1152 or something. And the correct answer is 11, uh, 11, 1160. So that's pretty pretty close, right? That's, that's kind of pretty amazing. Like, such a widely wrong answers actually converge into a really, um, apparently, pretty precise answer. Um, so that's kind of the prediction market. Um, uh, but what are the actual use cases? There are a lot of interesting use cases, other than the obvious ones of assassination markets, of, you know, uh, like sports gambling, which is trillion dollar market. There are some of the really things that actually could be good. Uh, weather insurance is a good example. So when you uh, think about a African farmer, Kenya farmer, who actually relies on the weather um, to you know, predict, have a predictable outcome of the crops, uh, they could no longer, they don't have to buy an ING insurance, which can be pretty expensive, they charge a huge premium, or may not even be accessible. But instead they would go to their mobile app, which is connected to the Augur decentralized exchange market.